Guilty, guilty, guilty. After deliberating for just one day, the jury found Derek Chauvin guilty on all counts. So, is the case over? Nope, not by a long shot. So, what happens next? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at the specific charges against Derek Chauvin. Of course, we'll look at the verdict that was guilty on all counts. We're going to look at the range of punishment, the terms of imprisonment he could be sentenced to. Then we're going to look at possible realistic punishments based upon the Minnesota sentencing guidelines. Finally, we're going to look at the process that's going to take place in this case from the issuance of the verdict from the jury all the way through sentencing in about eight weeks from the date of the verdict. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share me on social media. Remember that Lawyer Up episodes are available on all major podcast outlets. So first and foremost, let's go through the formal charges and the verdict and the sentencing range for each count so that we're up to speed and we are familiar. Now, count one was murder in the second degree, and this was the count that on or about May 25th, 2020, in Hennepin County, Minnesota, Derek Michael Chauvin caused the death of George Floyd while committing or attempting to commit a felony offense with force or violence. The verdict was, of course, guilty. The range of punishment for murder, too, is up to 40 years imprisonment in the Department of Corrections. And his actual sentence, of course, is still yet to be determined. Count two is murder in the third degree. Same basic windup that on or about May 25th, 2020, in Hennepin County, Minnesota, Derek Michael Chauvin caused the death of George Floyd by perpetrating an act eminently dangerous to others while evincing a depraved mind without regard for human life. The verdict, of course, guilty. Range of punishment up to 25 years imprisonment with the actual sentence still to be determined. Now, count three was manslaughter in the second degree. That on or about May 25th, 2020, again in Hennepin County, Minnesota, Derek Michael Chauvin caused the death of George Floyd by his culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk and taking a chance of causing the death or great bodily harm to George Floyd. Again, the verdict was guilty. A range of punishment on count three was up to 10 years in the Department of Corrections. So after the verdict was read, the state moved to have the defendant's bond revoked, and he was taken into custody pending sentencing. So he will sit in jail pending his sentencing date. Now that there is a verdict in the case, there is a second job that the fact finder must do, and that is to determine if there are any aggravating factors. Now, this could have been done by the jury, but Derek Chauvin waived that right, and he has elected to have the aggravating factors determined by the judge. Now, the first possible aggravating factor is whether the victim, George Floyd, was treated with particular cruelty. And this would include, of course, the knee to the neck for the 9 minutes and 29 seconds being an excessive duration, the pain compliance with the manipulation of his hand by squeezing his knuckles together and also forcing his wrist down to gain compliance through pain, and also the failure to render aid or CPR after not finding a pulse. These are all factors that could aggravate the circumstances in the judge's eyes. Now, the second possible aggravating factor is if the crime was committed with a child present. And if you recall, witnesses at the scene who testified included two teenagers who were 17 and a nine-year-old. So we did have children at the scene. The judge gave both lawyers, both sides, one week to file briefs on any aggravating factors. So the judge will ultimately rule on that particular issue. Now, if there are no aggravating factors, under the Minnesota sentencing guidelines, Chauvin could get 12 and a half years on either the second degree unintentional murder or the third degree murder charge. 
The sentencing guideline for the second degree manslaughter charge would be four years. Now, these sentences can run concurrently, meaning that the sentences run together at the same time. Or they could be run consecutively, which means you have to serve all of one sentence before the next one begins, and then they just stack on top of each other. Now, most likely in this case, these sentences will run concurrently because they're essentially three different crimes for the same action. So he didn't kill three different people. It was the same act that was an offense on three different levels. So more likely than not, the judge will sentence him to a concurrent sentence. Now, if the judge does find that there are aggravating factors, the judge can then go all the way up to the statutory maximums, which would be 40 years on count one, 25 years on count two, and 10 years on count three. Now that the jury has reached a verdict and the defendant has elected to have the aggravating factors determined by the judge, the jury is released and they can speak freely to anybody. They can talk to the media. They can talk to you. They can answer questions and they can give their opinions on what they thought of the trial and the trial process. Now, from there, the court also has ordered a pre-sentence report to be prepared. Uh, and this is essentially a report on the defendant. This will include his family, his work, his education, and his criminal histories, uh, and any other relevant life events uh, that the judge might need to know about in determining a sentence. This will also include interviews from friends and family members of the victim of George Floyd. So there'll be a lot of input from the victim on what they believe an appropriate sentence would be. The court has ordered this sentencing hearing to be in eight weeks. And sentencing, of course, is that's the hearing where the judge will determine the actual sentence that he hands down in the case. Now, in the interim, the defendant's lawyers will probably file post-trial motions to set aside the verdict, asking for a new trial, and they'll probably be argued in front of the judge and most likely denied because most are, unless there's a glaring error, that the judge observed and was pointed out by the parties. Now, at the sentencing hearing itself, really all gloves are off. There are no rules of evidence, and pretty much both sides can put on whatever type of testimony or argument they see fit. So you're going to hear a lot from George Floyd's family and friends on you know, the victim's behalf. You're also going to hear a lot from Derek Chauvin's friends, his family, other colleagues. They're going to speak about Chauvin. You might and probably will hear from Derek Chauvin himself at the sentencing hearing. But the judge, and only the judge, will be the individual who determines all by himself the actual sentence that is imposed for Derek Chauvin. Now, after the sentence and the judgment is final, then the defendant has the right to appeal the case. They don't have a right to appeal the case until they are sentenced. But once he is sentenced, he can appeal and have any irregularities of the trial addressed by the appellate court. However, generally speaking, when a case is on appeal, that does not stay or stop the prison sentence, and you have to sit in prison while your case is on appeal. So that's where we are in the process, and that is today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, smash that like button for me. If you got something to say or you have a question, put it in the comment section below. Remember to subscribe to the channel so you can stay up to speed on not only this trial, but also other relevant legal topics. And you guys know what I'm going to say next. I love it when you share me on social media. Again, my name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money. 